Hi, everybody. Um, so today, I'm really going to talk about uh, people with ideas. How do you validate those ideas? How do you demonstrate traction and demand for what you're doing without necessarily spending a lot of time developing product? So really quickly, uh, let's hear about you guys. How many people here are students? How many are business school students? How many people have, have worked in a startup before? All right, a lot of you guys. How many people have started their own companies? OK. Uh, how many people here have ever written a line of code? OK, a lot of you guys. Cool. Um, cool, so really quickly about myself. Uh, my name is Amit. I studied computer science at Northwestern. I worked in finance for JP Morgan, which sucked. I hated it. Uh, I worked for a small agency in New York doing digital strategy for BBC and Madison Square Garden. I lived in India for two years after that, working for a large web products company. Uh, and now I started this company called Startup Draft with a few of my friends. We help non-technical entrepreneurs build the first version of their web and mobile products. We got a lot of people who come to us with ideas. We've talked to like 200 uh, entrepreneurs, idea stage entrepreneurs. We see a lot of the same sort of mistakes, the same thought process that people go to. So, you know, we hear the same types of questions. So it makes sense for me to kind of talk to you guys about this. I'm also an NYU venture mentor this year, so maybe I'll, I'll be able to interact with some of you at that level as well. All right, so a quick introduction. What do these people have in common? First of all, who are these people? Yell them out if you know who they are. Founders, which founders? Jack Ma, that's a good one, that's a tough one, there you go. Bottom left, Alibaba. LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman, top, middle. Who else? You guys should know these guys. You guys don't know this guy? Groupon, Andrew Mason. This guy top left. Farmville, Zynga, Pincus. Um, top right is Birchbox. Bottom right, you guys know who this is? Uh, Brian Chesky from Airbnb, OK? What, what do all these people have in common, aside being successful founders? They have big smiles because they're making money, except for even Andrew Mason over here is making some money. What else do these people have in common? Cool. So they're all non-technical people, non-engineers who started successful companies, uh, specifically started successful technology companies. The point is the cost of technology today is decreasing. Technology is getting better, much more accessible to people. The cost of starting a startup is much less. Uh, it's not just sort of hackers in your Palo Alto basement anymore. Everyone in this room is capable of starting a technology company. We'll sort of get into that a little more. Whoops. So I hear this all the time. Uh, people come up to me and they say, I got this great idea. If only I could find a technical co-founder to build it for me. If only I could find an investor, all my problems would be solved. Uh, today we're going to talk about really what are the things that you need to do in order to attract technical talent and investment. Investment is earned, it's not given. A lot of people think that people are going to invest in their idea. It's really how much you can further your idea on your own. That's what's going to get you investment and sort of technical people to come join you. So the title of the talk is, I've got a great idea for a tech startup, now what? The short answer to that question is, validate your idea and demonstrate traction. And today we're going to talk about strategies for doing that. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about ideas. We're going to talk about picking the right idea. How do you know if an idea is good for you to execute on? We're going to talk about MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product. It means what's the thinnest slice of functionality that you need to be ordered to you know, prove your idea, test your hypothesis. We're going to talk about how do you define those. We'll talk about launching. We'll talk about getting early customers. We'll spend about 45 minutes doing that, then a QA, and a and then I have a group activity for you guys, which will hopefully put some of this into action. So ideas. In my personal opinion, there's three things that you should be thinking about when picking an idea for you to pursue. The first is domain experience. A lot of people try to start companies outside of the, everyone has experiences, whether it's hobbies, whether it's work experience, there's some vertical that you know very well. Uh, ideally, you know two verticals really well and you can form something at the intersection, but everyone has their own set of unique experiences. You should really try to start something in a, in a company, in a vertical that you know really well. 
So I'll give you guys a story from me personally of where this didn't exactly go right. We had this great idea, me and my two buddies, that we were going to build a content management system for restaurants. Our view is that restaurants had these terrible websites. There's all this third-party integration. They need Yelp. They have Foursquare deals. They have menu pages. They have Seamless Web. They have to connect to all these different third-party specific restaurant applications. We're going to build software as a service for them, an easy way for them to manage their online presence, uh, as well as uh, manage their deals. None of us had worked in the restaurant industry before. We went and we interviewed 10, 15 different restaurant owners, and we told them, we said, hey, we're going to build you guys this great tool for managing your restaurant. And they said, but I already just spent $10,000 on this, on this website. It's awesome. It's got flash. It's got techno music. It's really, really fucking cool. Uh, and you know, we had a difference of opinion there on, on what they should be having. Uh, we was like, okay, you got this website, but can you manage your Foursquare deal? And they're like, what the fuck is a Foursquare deal? I have no idea. So we obviously didn't know our customer segment that we were trying to sell to there. We didn't know the needs of restaurant owners, and therefore we weren't necessarily the right people to build this. Not to say that this couldn't be a successful product. There's a company called Single Platform that does this now. Former head of sales of Seamless started this company and is doing very, very well. So it's really important, play to your strengths, start with businesses that you know. You have the contacts there, you have unique experience and insights there. You can solve problems because you know that industry really well. The second thing is identifying good markets to enter. So what do you guys think, what makes a market good to enter? The size of the market. The size of the market. So you want to enter a big market, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as I mentioned, I'm also an NYU venture mentor. Someone the other day came up to us uh, doing halal vitamins. He showed us two graphs. One was vitamin usage, one was Muslim population, both trending upwards. And I'm like, this is great. Like, this guy's gonna, this guy's gonna kill it. So big markets, very important. Uh, number two, what else is sort of defines a good market to enter? Okay, I think competition is, is sometimes a good thing, but um, I agree with you. Um, you don't want to enter a, a, a very crowded space. Sometimes spaces become crowded because they're hot. If you look at deals, if you look at gaming, um, these are spaces that are hot because they have a lot of PR, they have a lot of investment, they have a few successes. Um, being you know, a person to, to enter those is sometimes good because you get the benefits of like me too type investment in PR. But at the same time, as you mentioned, they're crowded. Um, there's potentially a lot of competition. Cool, so you guys don't seem to want to talk to me, so I'll, I'll let you guys know what I think is good. Um, you want a market that's undergoing some sort of disruption or some sort of change. I read an article recently that says you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be starting technology companies today that you could have started three years ago. I don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but it's, it's an interesting way to think about it in terms of you want something that's changed, whether it's distribution mechanisms. So, Zynga was able to capitalize, the guys who make Farmville were able to capitalize on Facebook distribution as their initial model to get a ton of users really cheaply. Their acquisition costs for new users and their distribution model were changed. They were able to leverage that very effectively. Um, same if you look at Instagram, if you look at mobile photo sharing, um, if you look at the iPad, um, these are all new distribution mechanisms that weren't possible a few years ago that businesses can definitely be built upon those now. Okay, so the last thing, the last thing that's really important is passion. Um, you know, when you start a company, it should really be something that you're passionate about. A lot of times you can tell very obviously someone who's starting a company because they're identifying a market opportunity versus someone who loves the space and loves what they're doing. It makes it much easier to attract talent, raise investment when you're really, really passionate about what it is that you're doing. Um, you should be you know, committed to doing something in this space. It's a long-term commitment, three to five years. You should feel good sleeping about it, sleeping at night, thinking about your idea. You should be good telling your mom, your grandma about what it is. They might not understand but you should feel good sort of telling them about what it is. So ideas are assumptions. An idea is a hypothesis. It's a particular world view, okay? A lot of people take those good ideas that they have. They say, I've got this great idea, and think it's a fact. Really, it's a question. So your goal is to take whatever idea you have and turn it into a testable question. So I'll give you guys a couple of examples. Um, how many people are familiar with the company Skillshare? 
OK, so do one of you guys mind telling what Skillshare is? OK. Um, so Skillshare allows anyone to teach a class, and they can sign. They can get other students to pay and sign up. Um, it's peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Very cool company. Just raised a Series A based out of New York. Really good guys. Um, so what is their hypothesis? What is their world view? Why did they start this company? Everyone's got something they can teach others. So that's their hypothesis, right? How do you turn that into a testable question? Turn that same hypothesis into a question that you can test. I think that's good, but, it's, but you're implying a solution there. Um, I would change that around slightly to, will people pay to attend classes taught by their peers? Okay, And that doesn't imply a platform. It doesn't apply a solution. It implies, here's a problem that we're trying to identify and solve, uh, and here's a way that we could potentially solve that problem. Are you guys familiar with the company The Ladders? $100,000 plus job site. What is their unique hypothesis? Cool. So um, their view is that $100,000 jobs are harder to find, right? So how do you turn that into a testable question? Well, the answer to that is already there. I mean, you know that you know, Hot Jobs and Monster and all these sites have $100,000 plus jobs. So you know that they're there. But what's their uniques? Can you make it easy to find? Will people pay for an easy to find method to find high end jobs? OK? That's a testable question. Um, Zappos, I'm assuming you guys all know Zappos, shoe online retailer. When they started, it wasn't necessarily obvious. Uh, the idea of selling shoes online. Shoes were something that people had to try on. It wasn't obvious that this could be something that could be sold online. Their question was, will people buy shoes online? And we're going to talk in a little while. I'm going to get away from this and then come back about how all these companies, without building product, were able to test those assumptions and, and potentially get funded without building the platforms that you see today. So the first thing when you have an assumption or you have an hypothesis about what a good idea is, is really researching the problem space, not your particular solution. So uh, again, if we're taking the Skillshare example, right now they have a website. People list classes on that website. Other people sign up. If their initial question is, will people pay to, to take classes taught by their peers, there are a lot of different solutions that you could come up with that. They could approach a university to get someone to, to, you know, to get people to come and teach classes. Uh, they could have done newsletters. They could have done mobile apps. There are many different solutions. When we talk to people who are at the idea stage, a lot of times people fall in love with their solutions. Then they're reluctant to sort of switch and iterate. They learn stuff. And they're too tied to what their answer is rather than what the problem there is they're trying to solve. So really, you want to research the problem. You want to ask people, you know, you're going to ask your friends. You're going to say, hey, I've got this great idea. What do you think? They're going to be like, it's awesome. Like, go for it, you know, totally. Uh, that's not the type of question you want to ask. You don't want to ask people, do you like my idea? Instead, you want to ask them, you want to find out more about the problem space. You want to ask, you know, what are your pain points sort of addressing the problem space? What other solutions have you tried? Uh, what else is out there? How do you currently do this? Are there any hacks out there that let you accomplish what what, what it is that I want to do. Don't necessarily talk to them about your solution. Talk about the problems earlier on that they're facing. Um, it's also really important to ask people, once you're sort of getting a clear idea of the problem space, in terms of the solution, ask people why it won't work. Ask people why what you're doing is stupid. Because everyone you're going to talk to is kind of shoot you down. You have to have answers. You have to be prepared for problems that other people bring up. So don't ask them why it's a good idea. Ask them why it's a bad idea talk to people. A lot of people are really reluctant. They think everyone's going to steal their ideas. They think it's like the social network. Um, it's really, really important to talk to people about your ideas. No one's going to steal your idea. Uh, Eric Reese, for those of you who don't know, he's like a big lean startup guru. He was here last week. In his new book, he says, try, you know, take your second or third best idea. Try to find someone to steal it. He's like, email people at Facebook, email people at Google, write blog posts about it. Try to get someone to steal your idea. 
it's impossible. No one, everyone's got their own ideas, everyone's got their own agenda. No one's gonna listen to just your idea. People will copy you, people will imitate you only after you start showing traction, only after you have revenue, only after you have users. At that point, you know, people are seeing that this is actually something worth pursuing and you can expect that sort of, that sort of uh, stealing or imitation. So how do you validate an idea? And we'll go back to those questions in a second, but first you have to define and execute a test. And we'll sort of talk about what these companies did. Um, then you have to set goals and measure your results. So when you're setting a test, before we said, will people pay for classes taught by their peers, you should set up goals and say, you know, we'll get to the Skillshare example in a second, but they said, we're gonna manually create nine classes and try to sell them out. So they had a very clear hypothesis, question statement, goals. What happens afterwards is you wanna measure the results and you wanna see, you know, was I able to live up to those goals? If not, I might wanna suggest and try another solution. If so, what's my next big hypothesis that I'm trying to test? And now we'll sort of get into some examples. So back to our original examples, we said Skillshare again one more time. The hypothesis that they were testing, will people pay to, to learn from their peers? How are they able to test that? They created nine events over, so they set themselves up for three months. They said in three months, we're gonna create manually three classes a month using Eventbrite, a site that already exists, and we're gonna to try to collect 1,000 email addresses. That's our goal, to know if the product is valuable, if it's something that we should be worth pursuing. So they set up a really basic, this was their alpha version. They literally, they went to Eventbrite, they created events, they created this page which uh, is just front end, there's no server side code. This is something that you can outsource to India because it's not important. It just collects email addresses. It has three events each month. You click on this link, it takes you to Eventbrite. You pay for the event. Uh, each month they manually swapped out each of these items and put in new items. Uh, they, in their first three months, they sold out these three events. They ended up getting 7,500 email addresses because they wrote some interesting blog posts, this and that. They were able to raise money just on this. No server-side code at all was written. Very little from a technology investment, less than you know, $2,000. By showing that they had demand, by showing yes, they were able to sell classes, yes, people will pay for classes taught by their peers, they were able to get attract interest. So the ladders, earlier we said the question that the ladders was trying to solve in their initial sort of beta testing idea was, will people pay for easy access to $100,000 plus jobs, okay? The way they were doing it, Mark Sandella, their CEO said, uh, he went out manually, went to Hot Jobs, went to Monster, manually collected all the $100,000 jobs, uh, created a newsletter, charged people 25 bucks a month for access to his newsletter, and he would send it out on Monday morning, an email to all these people. Uh, he started doing this week on week. Again, there's no technology involved here. It's literally him going to Monster, getting emails, putting him in an email, and sending out to his subscriber list. He got people to subscribe by using Craigslist, by getting them to pay him on PayPal. He built no website for this. After nine weeks, he said after we'd been doing that for nine weeks, he missed the 9 a.m. Monday deadline, which is when he sent out the emails. He said around 9, 10, he started getting emails from people asking him where the newsletter was. Those emails kept coming. That was when I knew I was onto something. That was the moment of validation. So f the idea here is that he's delaying technology complexity. You wanna delay complexity as, as long as you can. You wanna test things manually. You wanna do them yourself. Only at the point where manual is not scalable do you really wanna start investing in technology to automate some of these things. Any questions about this stuff so far? You guys are quiet. Yeah. Sure. No, th so this was, okay, so this was a custom HTML, CSS, JavaScript page, front end technology. This is something that you don't need anything complex. There's actually, you could do this in WordPress, you could use Launch Rock for this. There's a lot of tools out there. You, without coding, can put something together like this very, very easily. You don't, have, you don't need a tech co-founder or anything to do something like this. Sure. Totally, and I'll get it back, I'll, I'll kind of answer your question, but I think the idea is once you have a testable hypothesis, you have to come up with what are all the methods I could do to achieve those goals. Uh, we'll talk about this a little later, but most times when you launch, you're gonna launch to resounding silence. 
you need to have a plan in place. You need to have, you know, my first three ideas for getting 1,000 users isn't going to work. What are my next 10 ideas? And you really want to plan this ahead of time because your first three ideas aren't going to work. Zappos. So the hypothesis that these guys were trying to test is will people buy shoes online? How would you guys test that? What's the easiest possible way to test will people buy shoes online? Put an ad on Craigslist, sure. You could definitely do that. Sell them on eBay, that's great. That's obviously you could sell them on eBay. So what the guy did, not Tony Shea, the guy before him who came in, he went to Foot Locker, took a bunch of pictures of shoes, put them up on a website, people emailed orders in, he went to Foot Locker, he bought the shoe, and he mailed it to the person, okay? No technology investment required there. I mean, very, very minimal technology investment. Uh, what he was able to do is delay complexity for as far as he can. Um, these guys are obviously super successful right now and had a huge payday. So a couple other quick examples. Uh, Seamless Web, I'm assuming you guys are all familiar, order food online. Uh, before they built any product, they had their sales team, they called up law firms in New York. They asked them, what do you guys want for lunch today? They would go go to the restaurants, order the food, pick up the restaurants, bring it to them, bill them at the end of the month. They literally had no website for their first like six months of operation, okay? Dropbox, Dropbox made a video of, are you guys, do you guys know Dropbox? Sync file sharing across computers. Um, these guys created a video of what their product were to look like. They did some product development. Uh, they put the video up on their website. They faked a bunch of features and said, this is what it, it's going to look like. Based on that, they were able to drive hundreds of thousands of signups to their site. They knew that this was something that people wanted before they spent the time building it. Groupon started out as a WordPress site. Uh, you know, it, Andrew Mason has, has, uh, has an interview on, on Mixergy, which says the first version of the site, they put a t-shirt on the site. They said, this t-shirt is red, and it comes in size large. If you want something else, email us, OK? Uh, they'd sell 500 coupons for sushi. They would literally, that day, make PDFs of all the coupons, use Apple Mail to send those coupons out to the 500 people. Literally no technology or very, very little technology investment until they were able to actually generate revenue and users. Single platform, very similarly, earlier I said they build a platform for restaurants, hotels, bars to manage their online presence and deals. Uh, again, these guys, same thing. They spent three to six months before they had product selling to actual businesses. Uh, just with some wireframes and designs, they were able to actually get money, get letters of intent from companies to sign up for their business. Um, obviously, that's very hard. It's hard to sell something that doesn't exist. But if your strength is sales, if you can get people to sign letter of intents before your product is built, that's obviously a direction that you should consider exploring. Most startups fail because of, pre yeah. Yeah. That's, that example is not exactly true because they actually did, they built some product, but then they faked a little bit of some of the features, and they made it look a lot better than it actually was at the time. So once they found out that they had that demand, they still think they didn't have a problem building it exactly as they said they would. I mean, how long did it take them? Were people upset that it took them that long? I'm sure it did. I mean, I, I don't think there's expectations from users in terms of, well, you had this video on the internet, and three months later, like, I expect to have it. I don't think it's exactly like that. Um, what it did allow them to do is when they were ready, when they were comfortable that the product was at a place that it was time to sell, they had hundreds of thousands of email addresses to start seeding their product to start selling. So they were able to, again, sort of demonstrate demand and, and grow a user base before actually having any product. What is the sign-up rate? Once you send more details, like, is there a cap of how much data that can go back to the There's no, I, I don't have those numbers. I'm sure they have those numbers. Um, a lot of times you hear on the web uh, free to paid conversions. So the freemium model is somewhere 3 to 5% your users will convert. Um, but again, it's, it's totally, it really depends on the product and, and what it is that you're doing. So Startup Genome was a report that was released a couple months ago, analyzed 3,200 startups. It said the most common cause of failure is because of premature scaling. This is not necessarily technology. It's also from people spending too much money on hiring. Uh, it's from a product perspective. Um, again, the idea is really fake it till you make it, 
delay for as long as possible, delay complexity till you actually need to sort of automate things to build the technology, to hire people. Get as far as you can on your own without anyone else. Yeah. No, no, and no, no. I, okay, I, I have I have some two more examples about this, and then I'm kind of moving on. So, Aardvark is a social question and answer service that was bought by Google. Uh, their philosophy. So Google's really bad at answering questions like, uh, where should I go out for a drink after work in Soho? What kind of camera should I buy? Should I go to business school? Google's really bad at answering those questions, but people are obviously good at answering those types of questions. So they developed a service based over Instant Messenger. You would ask a question, Aardvark would do some magic, get three other people to answer your question. Okay, Three people who they thought would be a good fit to answer your question, they would answer back. They call this Wizard of Oz testing. That magic that I just described was actually eight interns. So they had eight interns, 24 hours. Someone would ask a question. It would come to them. They would IM three other people, ask them the question. Those th three people would say, you should go to this bar. You should go to that bar. And they responded back to the original person. Um, these guys were able to raise money, eventually be very, very successful, without building out the most complex technology piece of their product. So they call that Wizard of Oz testing. There's some magic going on behind the curtain. You open the curtain and it's you know a midget or something. Um, Zynga, uh, they call this ghetto testing or smoke testing. Pincus has a good talk where he says, let's say you're a product developer, a game designer, a product manager, whatever it is. You got this great idea for a new game. You say, everyone wants to run their own hospital. Why don't we create a hospital game? Uh, so he says, pretend it's six months down the road. Your, your game is built, it's perfect, it has every feature you've ever wanted. Describe it to me in two sentences, okay? He uses those two sentences, he puts it at the top of Farmville, and he measures the amount of people who click on that link. Okay, he says, ever wanted to run your own hospital? Try this new game. He doesn't have the game, the game doesn't exist. He's just seeing how many people will click on that link. And what he's able to do is compare that to other games. So if six people have games, he puts the six descriptions up there, he rotates them, the one that gets the most click-through rates is the one that has the most demand. Does that make sense? A lot of people, if you read on the internet, they say you can test you know, product ideas with buying some Google ads, measuring the click-through rates. That stuff is really good if you're trying to test things against each other. But how do you know what a 5% conversion rate means, what a 3% click-through rate means? It's only good when you're comparing it against other things that you have. It's not good for necessarily sort of managing your own ideas. Questions about this? Did that answer your question a little bit? I, I, it could be a sign-up page, but he was saying in his talk, if it's really ghetto, it goes to a 404 page. Page not found. Like, it doesn't matter. That's the whole point, is that it, it really doesn't matter. The point, all they're trying to do is capture intent. You know, and they're just trying to see, will, do people want that? Will they click on the link? Any other questions about this? Cool, so how do you define an MVP? How do you define sort of, you know, once you have your hypothesis, once you've tested it out, once you've validated it, the idea is that you want to do the minimum amount of work necessary in order to decide if that idea is worth pursuing. I think there's a few questions that no matter what business, no matter what product you're doing, uh, is important to answer. The first question is, will people use it? And it's not just will people come to the site once, it's will they actually come back? Uh, will they tell their friends about it? Will people pay for it? Every business has their own risks associated with it. What you really want to do is prioritize those risks and identify what are the biggest questions we have and start answering. Come up with tests to answer those first. So a product that we built recently that we launched like two weeks ago, it's called a product called Service 8. Okay? What it does is it allows you to look for local, if you guys are familiar with Service Magic or Thumbtack or Red Beacon, it allows you to look for local plumbers or locksmiths or contractors in your area. The way that we're doing this, someone says, I'm looking for a plumber in New York. We use the Google Places API. We literally search Google for plumbers in New York. And we use Twilio, which is a voice and SMS uh, software, to send out automated calls to the 50 plumbers in your neighborhood. So that plumber will get a message, hey, Amit in New York is looking for a plumber. He's using servicesafe.com to stay organized. Log in with pin code 1234 to find out more about this job. You guys understand what, what the project was? Some people? OK, so the idea here, so previously we had tried to do a project in the lead gen space. 
we knew from firsthand experience that locksmiths are not necessarily technology savvy. They get sold a lot. They don't necessarily want to pay for leads. Our biggest question before we started this project were, will service providers answer robocalls, you know, automated voice calls telling them to log into this website? So what we did, super simple, we created a landing page, not this one, just had the email address field blank. We sent out 100 fake calls to locksmiths in New York, 100 fake calls to uh, plumbers in you know, Michigan, 100 fake calls to contractors in you know, Florida, wherever it was. Uh, just by tweaking around the messaging, uh, we asked them to come to the site and put in their email address. We got about a 15% response rate, which was enough for us to say with some conviction, yes, this model can be successful. That was the biggest risk that we identified. We tested it three hours of work to set up those automated calls to get people to sign into those landing pages. That was enough for us to say, yes, we have conviction that this is actually a good idea and worth pursuing. It's, I mean, it's gut instinct. I think a lot of these times when you're sort of measuring stuff, um, obviously it wouldn't have been more expensive for us to go out and continue doing this. In our first 200, we had a 15% response rate. I think we ended up doing 500, and we saw from batch to batch there were only minor variations. So it was enough for us to say, hey, it's not fluctuating tremendously on a batch by batch basis. That was enough for us to have confidence. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm sure there's statistics people out here who would tell me I'm totally wrong and that our sample size is not statistically significant, but for us it was enough to move forward. Okay, so once you've sort of developed an MVP, it's really, really important to launch early. A lot of you guys come from corporate backgrounds or other types of backgrounds where you used to sort of uh, a very high level of quality insurance. Uh, it's really important to sort of perfect things before they go out. In the startup world, it's actually the opposite case. Uh, it's not going to work in IE. Uh, when you click on stuff, like sometimes it'll hang and break. Uh, that's okay. Uh, you're not looking for perfection here. You're not looking to get as many people as you can immediately. All you're trying to do is sort of test your initial hypothesis. You know, people are scared that they're putting their reputation on the line. The first version is only a very thin slice of what their actual vision is that by putting out this first version, people are gonna be judging them, they've been working on this for months, and the quality of the product is not as high as they know it can be. You have to get over that, and you have to understand that uh, it's okay, it's okay to launch things quickly, uh, it's okay if it's not perfect the first time. And how do you sort of compensate for that? It's by finding the right types of early customers. So what you don't wanna do is do a big PR press launch. You don't want to start emailing TechCrunch with your product that you just launched that has no users. What you really want to do is collect a very small sample size of people who feel the problem most acutely. Because those are the types of people who are going to be most uh, accepting of mistakes and the people who will be sort of giving you feedback and those are the people who will be your early evangelists. So what you want to do is keep iterating until this small sample size, 10, 50, 100, are using the product in the way you intended to. So if these people are coming once and never coming again, you know you have to change something. You change something, you try another 100 people, okay, they're coming to the site a couple times, but they're not necessarily converting to paid. Okay, you know it's time to change something. What happens is if you get a huge number of people to come to your site before you sort of analyze the conversion funnel, before you get people to use the site or, or the product in the way that you want it to, we call it a leaky bucket. You're going to keep spending time getting more users to try to fill up this bucket, but people are just going to be washing out the bottom because they're not interested in using it the way you've intended it to. So small circles and keep expanding every time you can get people to use the product in the way you intend to. Does that make sense? Make early customers, you should, really, you should really connect with early customers. You should find out, you should get, know them by name. You should find out what they want. Hopefully you've been talking to them about the problem space. When they communicate feedback to you, listen to them. When you, when you implement some of their ideas, give them credit, give them props. Let them know new stuff that you're doing. Be honest and open with them. Make them feel like they have skin in the game because then they're gonna be telling their friends about it. They're gonna feel like they're part of it this early adopter sort of mentality, people want to seem like they're, yeah. A lot of things are technically demoed in a way. How yeah. do you get in touch with them? And it's really starting to build. Like, I think it really depends. I mean, again, I'm talking early customers, like your first 50 or first 100 customers are going to be people you know. You know, most likely they're going to be in your so social network, your friends, your friends of friends, whatever it is. You're not doing out and doing a big marketing push. No one's going to know about this site until you tell people about it. So those first early people, 
you know, you're interviewing people who feel the problem acutely, you're finding people in the right sort of target demographic, you should get to know these people as well as you can. Oh, yeah. No, uh, we did after our first couple of tests. We, we talked to people who successfully came in and responded and gave bids for the job. And then we talked to people who didn't. And we were trying to analyze why some people did and why some people didn't. We still haven't done a big marketing push for this. We have ideas in terms of you know, how to grow out the user base. Uh, but we're not doing that until we, we achieve certain you know, business and product goals that we want to see. So Angie's List is paid for consumers. This is service providers pay only when a user selects them for that lead. So the point wasn't necessarily to talk about the product, but uh, users request, say, I have a leaky faucet. I need you know, plumbers, 50 plumbers, maybe because it's a 15% rate, maybe five plumbers will log in. They'll look at the job. They'll provide an estimate. A user will select one of them based on their estimates. Then the service provider is asked to pay in order to, to get the contact information. Yeah, we're using Yelp recommendations. So, you know, it, again, in your first version, you want to leverage existing APIs. You don't want to have people follow. You don't want to friend people. You don't want to use comments. All this stuff exists. Other people have specialized in developing this. You want to build on top of this stuff. We leverage Google Places, Yelp, uh, payment systems, you know, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we just built on top of all these to provide a unique value. Any other questions so far? Yeah. I think it really depends on the particular product. They say, you know, whatever, 80-20 rule, 80% of your profits come from 20% of your customers. Um, you know, you really have to focus on, do you want a small amount of high paying customers or do you want a lot of small paying customers? Um, generally, the former is easier, where if you can give it out to free and get 10% of them to convert but charge them a high rate because they're, they're lovers of the product, they use it on a daily basis, you really want to get those super users to pay. And that's how games work these days. Uh, games are free, and you pay when you want extra points to buy new swords and like poker chips or whatever it is. Um, they're, it's free for most people, but then there's that top 5% who are just going to go crazy on the game and just want to be like the absolute top. So. Um, it's better to monetize as much as you can from the people who are most sort of passionate, but it, it really depends on, on your business. Cool, so what do you do when product, okay, so product market fit is a term which is in sort of the lean startup world where um, the early stages of your idea, you're really trying to find a product that meets the market demand, okay? And once you find that is really when investors will Put money into you. Once you can show demand, once you can show that this is a product that people actually want, is when investors will actually talk to you. Um, what do you do when product market fit isn't happening? And this is going to be what happens the first time you launch a product. No one's going to care. Um, you're going to launch a thundering silence. Um, we were talking about this earlier where it's really important. So the Skillshare guys, they had three classes a month that they were trying to sell. Uh, they were able to do it, but they came up with strategies for doing it. So we're going to write blog posts, contrarian blog posts, you know, why college is overrated. Um, you know, that was one of their strategies. Um, the idea is really to create a mass, a huge brainstorming list of how are you going to go achieve those goals. And sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you're going to fail. Uh, you know, then comes the question, is it worth pursuing in the way that I initially thought of it? Is my hypothesis still valid? If the answer to my question is no, what can I learn from that and apply to a new question? What's the next question I have to ask based on what it is that I've learned? OK, so uh, just really quickly in summary. So when you have a new idea, you want to turn that idea into a testable hypothesis. You want to set realistic goals, and it's really important to understand how to measure those goals early on. So selling out nine classes is, is fairly straightforward. Getting 1,000 email address signups, although is not a great measure of intent, but that's something that you can measure. When you set goals, they have to be measurable goals. You want to launch experiments with the least amount of effort. Uh, there's a, it's amazing how much stuff you can do with Craigslist, with buying uh, Starbucks gift cards and asking people to do stuff with you if you buy their coffee for them. Uh, eBay, there's lots of ways to do this stuff really manually. After you launch something, 
people forget, it's important to celebrate, have a beer, calm down, relax, think about what you've done, enjoy your, your small success. Then measure your results, take what you've learned, and either move on to the next hypothesis or change your hypothesis to start testing a new question. OK, I have a little side note that we're going to do a Q&A and then a group activity. Uh, my quick side note is skills that I think everyone in here, if they're thinking about starting a company, these are skills that you should all have. The first is creating a strong online presence. How many people here blog? Not very many of you guys. How many people use Twitter actively? Okay, so whatever, whatever format it is, whether it's, you know, I, I, you should blog. Everyone should be blogging. Everyone should be writing. It's amazing. It's a small community. When you honestly talk about lessons that you've learned, even if you failed, those stories get pushed up to the top of Hacker News uh, every day. When users say, what are the best stories, they all want to hear personal experiences. They don't want to know what worked. They want to also know what didn't work. If you can communicate openly and honestly about your experiences, it opens up a ton of doors and potential. Unexpected rewards. People will come up to you and say, hey, I saw that you tried this, but have you thought about trying this? It's amazing when you put yourself out there uh, and talk honestly and openly about what it is that you're doing, how much people will sort of rally around your cause and how much you'll be in a position to get unexpected benefits because of that. Technology. Now, if you're a non-technical person, which about half of you guys are, you know, I think there's a, there's a big school of thought now that everyone should be able to code. I kind of half believe that. I kind of half don't. I think you should focus on your strengths. If you're not if you're not interested in programming and you're not passionate about it, you shouldn't be doing it. There's other people who can do it. Focus on the things that you're really good at. But at a very basic level, you should understand HTML and CSS. Um, if you shouldn't be asking your technology team to uh, change you know, copy on your home page, to switch a button color. These are things that you should be able to handle yourself. Uh, hosting and DNS, having a very basic understanding. And this is not complicated. It's not technical. Um, it's really you know, the easiest way to do this is if you don't have a blog, set up a WordPress blog on your own domain. Buy a domain, set up a WordPress blog on it, configure Google Apps for that domain, and you'll learn a ton about A records, C name records, setting up mail. It's not hard. It's just something you have to go through. Uh, and it'll help tremendously uh, when communicating with sort of technical people. Marketing. Everyone should have experience with Google AdWords. It's tremendously important to understand how online advertising works. Um, obviously, it's expensive and there's risks. Google has a program. It could be expensive. Google has a program called Google Grants. It lets any NGO apply for free to get up to $10,000 a month for free Google AdWords. Find an NGO. Find a cause you care about. They don't know about this program, I promise you. Tell them about it. Ask them or apply on their behalf. Then you have $10,003 a month to play around with Google AdWords. You'll learn a tremendous amount. You'll be writing ads. You'll be launching campaigns. You'll be setting up goals. You'll be driving more people to their website. Uh, it's really, really good and really important. This is how I actually I started doing this like two years ago, doing AdWords. I applied for an NGO. It was an awesome experience. And you get an absurd amount of free money to play with. And it's amazing how much you can learn. It's called Google Grants. And it's for specifically for NGOs. Web analytics. So we talked a lot about measuring uh, goals, conversions, funnels, all that stuff is really, really important. There's a book called Web Analytics 2.0 by Avinash Kaushik, who's the Google's chief analytics evangelist. It's not as dry as it sounds, I promise. He's actually like kind of funny and interesting. Uh, it's worth checking out, if only to read the first couple of chapters, having a really basic understanding of what web analytics are important, how do you measure them, what are goals, funnels, conversion rates, how do you measure all this stuff. Tremendously important for you leading a technology company. Eric Reese again was here last week. He wrote a book that came out three weeks ago called The Lean Startup. He talks a lot about what I just talked about, but in much more detail, and he's much better at it. Um, I suggest you guys read the book. Um, along with creating a strong online presence is also getting to know people in person, getting out of the building. Um, go to Skillshare classes like I, I talked about earlier. There's a service called ohours.org. It stands for office hours. A lot of New York tech people sign up to give 15, 20 minutes of free time to people. Um, you can meet people at top companies in New York, top startups. They'll for free, whatever, just spend 20 minutes with you. You can ask them whatever you want. They're totally happy to do it. I've been to like nine of them. I've hosted two of them. It's a really, really nice service. Uh, go to meetups and events, talk to people, get to know people. Don't spend all your time doing this stuff. You should actually like build products and, and companies, but um, it's good to, to get to know people.